We live in a unique time in history in which the topic of identity and gender is a lightning rod for fierce discussion and debate. Never before have we carried such passionate thoughts and opinions about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Never before have those views been so diverse and our comments so divisive. In the midst of this climate, it's hard to see what is right, to know what is true and to celebrate what is beautiful. Yet we are committed to journeying together to explore God's Word and seek His vision. Beginning in the Garden of Eden and journeying through to the new creation, we want to discover what God says to our world about being a man and about being a woman. We do this with a deep longing for truth and a firm conviction that God's design for humanity is beautiful. And knowing who we are before Him is not only good and right, but vital for the relationships we were made to know and to enjoy. Good morning. And once again, welcome to Radiant Church. So great to have you with us. I want to particularly welcome those who are at all of our campuses and those watching online. So great to have you with us today. Let's give all of them a great big hand today. We are starting a new series of teachings, and next week my wife is going to be talking about sex. So I'm expecting capacity crowds at all of our campuses, and I am so looking forward to hear what she has to say. And then the final week of this series, I'm going to be talking about biblical masculinity, what the Bible says about being a man. And I think it's going to be very pertinent to men and women here, and I believe that you will want your husbands, your sons, uh, your boyfriends to be here for that particular message, and that's going to be on Father's Day. Now... Today, we're going to be talking about biblical clarity for the sexually confused, because there's a tremendous amount of sexual confusion within our culture. Back in 2015, Vanity Fair magazine came out, and on the cover was Bruce Jenner. And the comment, the headline was, call me Caitlin, because the former gold medal decathlete had gone through a sexual transition surgery to become a woman. And in the article, he said, I'm happy after such a long struggle to be living my true identity. Now, that has been called a transgender moment in our society. Now, about that same time, Obama Justice Department leaders issued the so-called bathroom bills that open public bathrooms for use, not according to biological gender, but according to the gender as someone identified themselves as being. At that same time, Target stores did the same with their changing rooms, and many politicians, educators, entertainers, and business leaders started lining up behind the transgender agenda. Now, up until that time, all of us had been told that our objective biological facts determined our gender. But now we were being told something much different. Now, it was your subjective perspective that mattered. Or as some put it, it's not your biology, it's your psychology. And because of this, there's been a tremendous push by some to remove all gender-specific terms such as he or she. In fact, not long ago... Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle of Great Britain, gave birth to a son. And some in the press were highly critical that they named their son Archie because they said he should have been given a gender-neutral name so he could decide his own gender. And in some places, gender-specific school uniforms have been banned, and it has certainly affected the sports world. Men are now being allowed to compete in women's sports if they say they identify as a woman. In Connecticut, they're able to compete as females if they simply identify as female. So a biological male named Terry Miller competed as a female, and he crushed his female competition, winning all the races he competed in and shattering the old woman's 55-meter dash record. Just 18 months ago, Craig Tiffer ran in a 440-meter race. And in that race, competing against nine men, he finished in eighth place, or next to last. Well, this past Saturday, 
he competed not as a male, but as a female because that was his preferred gender. And so because of that, he competed against women. And he decisively finished in first place against all female competitors. The transgender revolution is making a travesty of women's sports. And sometimes it results in abuse. In a martial arts league, Fallon Fox, a biological male, was allowed to fight as a woman because he identified as one. The consequence was that Fox sent fighter Tamika Brents, a female, to the hospital with a broken skull and a concussion. Brents needed seven surgical staples to bind her wounds. Brents, a trained fighter herself, said of her match with Fox, I've never felt so completely overpowered in my life. Now that gender is not determined by biology, but by psychology, Facebook offers 58 gender identities to choose from. In fact, activists in this movement say biology is bigotry. And being able to determine your own gender is seen by many as a civil rights issue equivalent to race. So the state of Colorado now allows people to list their gender on their driver's license as something other than that which they were born. So people in Colorado, we can now get our birth certificate reissued with a new preferred gender identity. It could be male, it could be female, or we could simply be known as X, just by putting that request in writing. Uh, maybe you saw the recent Gillette ad where it showed a female who now had transitioned to become a male and she was shaving for the very first time her face and her dad was teaching her how to do it. Now, many of us have seen all of this and we've wondered, what in the world is going on? What has happened? Well, here's the reality. There are some people who suffer with a condition that is called gender dysphoria. And let me tell you, it's real. It's painful. I have listened to numerous testimonies of people who face this. And we all need to have tremendous compassion for these people. Because it is a real challenge, it is a real struggle. And a person with gender dysphoria feels like there's a disconnect between who they think they are and the biological reality. It feels like this started with the legalization of same-sex marriage, but actually they're very different things. Homosexuality and lesbianism and same-sex attraction are not the same thing. We're talking about something concerning not who you're attracted to, but who you deep down believe yourself to be. So you have a person who's biologically male, but deep down inside feel they're really female, trapped in a man's body. Or a person who is female, deep down inside they feel they are a male in a female body. Now how many people face this? Well, it's estimated between one half percent to one and a half percent of men in our society face that. And less than one third of one percent of women suffer from gender dysphoria. Now that is a tiny percentage of our population. And as I said, we should have real compassion for these people. And as a church, I believe we can offer hope to these people. I believe there's real hope. And if you're watching today and you battle with gender dysphoria, I want you to hang on. I want you to listen to what we have to say because I believe the Bible gives us some real hope. Now, part of the response of our society, I understand. I understand the feeling that there needs to be inclusion and there needs to be compassion. I don't think the prescription has been a good one. I think there's other steps we can take. But though I don't believe it's the best way to handle it, I want you to understand that this onslaught is far deeper than simply compassion or inclusion. It is the evidence of a social quake and part of a transition from America formally being a Christian nation to becoming a secular nation, and I would even say a pagan nation. Now, there is no question that America was once a Christian nation. 
It doesn't take a whole lot of research. You just look at some of the founders and what they had to say. We were once a nation based on a Christian Judeo ethic. That's where our laws came from. That's the way our founders thought, but not anymore. I believe President Obama was right when he said we're no longer a Christian nation. And in doing research for this study, I uh, did a study based on Peter Jones's material and Daniel Hembach's material from 2002 and 2003 publications. And they say this agenda of gender fluidity was embraced by the radicals of the 1960s. And by the 1990s, they had begun to take power in our nation. And now they're pushing a social agenda of sexual liberation and extreme tolerance. Now, something you've got to understand is that before the 1970s, the term gender was not used in science. You were either male or you were female. The word gender came out of the English departments, and it was used for a specific purpose. The secular pagan agenda, the idea was to eliminate all distinctions. Sexual identity became fluid and not absolute. That's because Androgyny is part of the neo-pagan utopia vision and seen as the ideal. The idea of sexual identity being plastic and having no fixed meaning and you being whatever you choose comes out of paganism. And it is a tenet of militant secularism and it's part of the LGBT agenda. And ultimately, it's an assault on God as our creator. Because really, this is spiritual. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So this is not a flesh and blood battle. This isn't a battle against human beings. This is truly a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual fight. And the soul of America and the soul of the church in many places is actually at stake. This is also a worldview battle. A secular society worldview is that the world is one of our own making and we can invite God into it. The Christian worldview is that we live in God's world and he invites us to be a part of it. And so because of that, we're called on to live according to God's wisdom. And where do we find God's wisdom? We find God's wisdom in God's word. And God's word has a tremendous amount to say about our sexuality. The first thing we learn in the beginning pages of the Bible in the book of Genesis is that God created human beings as male and female. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, I've drawn on many sources to talk to you today and to put this talk together. One of those sources and one of my most important references I'm going to make today is to a man named Sam Alberry, who works with the Ravi Zechariah Ministries. And he brought some important ideas out of this passage, that gender identity is actually in this passage embodied. Their gender is physically grounded, not psychologically determined. God didn't create, and I want you to hear this, non-physical beings he didn't create a non-physical being called Adam and then look to find him a body. But he fashioned a biological male body that he named Adam. And get this, Paul tells us we're spirit, soul, and body. So Adam was male spirit, male soul, and male body. Gender identity is foundational to being an image bearer of God. And here's the reality. Every human being has been made in the image of God. The stamp of God is on us. So every human being should be treated with value and worth and significance because we have been made in the image of God. And human beings are not the only male and females in God's creation, but we are the only creatures whose maleness and femaleness has that kind of significance. So humanity is binary. We're binary. You know, some say gender is non-binary. That gender is, is some kind of scale or some kind of range. But that's not what the scripture teaches. It teaches we're binary. It teaches there are two sexes, not a range of genders. 
Humans can only fully image God as both male and female, the mixing of the two. I want you to think about this. If there were a community that was made up only of men, something would certainly be lacking. Or if there was a community made up of only women, there would be something lacking. We need each other. We need our differences. We need one another. And if that were not the case, then only the strong survive. And the weaker are crushed underfoot. But men need women and women need men. And gender is not a social construct, but a creation of the living God. We were created male and female, and it is sacred. Now listen to me here. Rejecting your God-given gender is the equivalent of rebelling against your creator. So often I take you back to Genesis chapter 3 and the original sin, the sin that led to the fall, the sin that blitzed the human race and caused all the problems we have now. And the serpent, Satan, came to the woman, and what was the original lie? The lie was that you, independent of God, shall be as God. And so when they rebelled and they rejected the truth of God and they believed that lie, what was something they were doing there? They were rejecting their God-given identity because what was their identity? Creature. What was their identity? Person, human being. But what were they saying? I want the identity of a God. I want to be as God. I want to be divine. And God is saying, that is not your identity. I've made you to be a creature, submitted and surrendered to me. And that is called original sin. And that is what led to the fall. To reject how God made us is to reject God. It is accusing God of not being wise with how he dealt with our bodies. It's worshiping, as Paul says, the creation of rather than worshiping the creator. And that's what we do when we deny the truth of how God identifies us. And the idea that we can decide our own gender is a satanically inspired assault on the image of God. And Jesus reiterated this truth. We find it over in Matthew chapter 19, verses four and five. And Jesus answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus said, God made them male and female. He said, there's a difference between the genders. Now, let me make a side note here. This is a side note. There are people who say Jesus said nothing about homosexuality. He said nothing about same-sex marriage. Well, excuse me, but he just did. He said marriage is to be between one man and one woman for one lifetime. That is God's best. That is God's design. Anything less is less than God intended. And marriage by God's design is always between one man and one woman. As I said, that's an aside. But what I really want you to see here is that gender is biologically grounded and it's a calling. You're called to be a man. You're called to be a woman. We're called for a divine purpose. And science has found again and again that boys and girls are different. They are hardwired different. The transgender movement is actually horribly unscientific. Science tells us men and women are different. We have different brains. We have different hormones. We have different chromosomes. We have different bodies. And I say, viva la difference. It's a great difference. In the Break Free Encounter weekend, Jack Schultz said this, no amount of surgery, hormone injections, or hormone blockers or anything else will change someone's DNA from a man to a woman or a woman to a man. Because human sexuality is determined by the presence of the Y chromosome. Humans with an XY chromosome are male, and those with an XX chromosome are female. The DNA you received at birth is unchangeable. That means somebody could go through a sex change therapy, and they could change their voice, they could change their appearance, but then they're in an accident, and they die, and they do an autopsy, and they find out that that person who said they were a woman is actually a man. Because it's in our DNA. It's who we really are. And God created us male and female. 
And we are made male and female, spirit, soul, and body. Now get this. This goes back to Augustine, but it's in the scripture that there is coming a day when Jesus Christ is returning. And when he comes back, we are going to get resurrection bodies. God cares about our bodies. He's going to resurrect them. He's going to recreate them. But when they're resurrected, they're going to be male and female. We are eternally what God made us to be, male and female. It was not a mistake. It was his purpose and his plan. So why is it that some people suffer with gender dysphoria? Well, it's because we live in a fallen world. And we live with futile thinking. Romans chapter 8 brings this out. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 8, verses 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to futility... That was in the fall. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. God allowed it to come under futility because he had an ultimate purpose even in that. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. That's when Christ returns into the glorious liberty of the children of God. But right now, things are not right in this world. This physical world is broken. And we've been subjected to futility. It doesn't work properly. As people, we are not right. Our bodies are subject to frustration. And I think we all know that. I prayed with people today going through serious physical issues. I talked with someone today dealing with Parkinson's, another person dealing with cancer. Why is that? Because we're not the way God intended for us to be. God didn't intend for that. Someday we're going to get a recreated universe where there is no more sickness, no more disease, no more death. But the reality is now we face that because there was a real historic fall. In fact, within this fallen world, there are some people called intersex people. It's one out of every 2,000 people. And of those people, there are actually biological issues involved. Why? Because we're fallen. Because things aren't always right. There's genetic abnormalities. That does happen. And Jesus talks about how to deal with that, I believe, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. And for sake of time, I'm not going to get into all that. Plus, it'll probably take us down a rabbit trail. Instead, I want to get to the main point we're focusing on. And that is that we live in a broken and a fallen world. Not only that, but mankind has rejected the God who wants to restore our brokenness. We see this over in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. It says, because mankind knew God, but they didn't glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. All of us can be futile in our thinking and darkened in our understanding. One person called this a very unflattering anthropology, and I agree. We don't have enough access to ultimate information to really determine who we are. You know, I can't really fully identify myself based on my feelings, based on my futile thinking. I need an outside source to identify me. All of us have dealt with identity issues, but where we find our true identity is in God and what he said in the scripture. But today when children express some kind of gender confusion, which is usually something most kids experience and eventually grow out of, many kids experience that, but they grow out of it. But parents today are rushing to dress them in clothes of the opposite sex and even getting them hormone treatments to block normal sexual development. And the American College of Pediatrics called that a form of child abuse. And I would agree. Because we are trying to conform our thinking to our feelings, and we're trying to conform our bodies to our emotions rather than to God's word. And the scripture says we're to conform our thinking to the truth, not to try to change the truth to conform our thinking. And that is a critical principle for all of us who are trying to follow Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18 says this, and this is Paul speaking. He says, I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer, listen to this, walk as the rest of the Gentiles or the rest of the heathen or the rest of the pagan world walks in the futility of their minds. 
having their understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. I could really take some time to exegete all of that, but let me simply say that what that's telling us is you can't count on your feelings and you can't count on your futile thinking. You can't count on your heart. (laughs) You can't count on your heart. Jeremiah says this, that the heart of man is desperately wicked. So we shouldn't base our identity on our futile thinking and on our contrary emotions and our feelings that are fickle. We have to base them on God's word. We have to base them on truth. You know, facts are difficult things. They're true. There's ultimate truth. And if we are trying to live something other than reality, we get into trouble. Let me give you a great example of this. And I think this is going to be so helpful to so many of you. And that is anorexia. Anorexia is a real problem for people. I've known people who have battled anorexia. And there's a distortion in their thinking. So you can have this person who's nearly on the brink of starvation, and they look in the mirror and they perceive themselves as fat. They think and they feel like they're obese. But really, they're nearly died of malnutrition. Now, what would be the kind thing to do? The kind thing to do would say, your perception is wrong. Your thinking is wrong. Your feeling is wrong. You are not who you're perceiving yourself to be. You are not fat. You actually need nutrition. You need help in this area. You need to align your thinking to reality. You know what you wouldn't do? You wouldn't go up to that anorexic person and say, oh, you perceive yourself as fat? Okay, we're going to get you on a diet program. We are going to lower your calories. We're going to put you on an exercise program. I'll be your coach. We're going to go work out. I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that because that would be considered abuse. That would be considered cruel. That would be foolish. But that is exactly what's happening in the area of gender dysphoria. We're basing it on feelings and emotions instead of Abject truth, objective truth. Now, as followers of Christ, we have learned we have to take the facts of God's word above feelings. But the transgender movement says you have to trust your inner feelings. Now, the scripture teaches we have to bring our fickle feelings under the subjection of God's word. And what does the scripture really tell us? It tells us when you receive Jesus Christ, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a miracle. But God literally comes to live in you by the Holy Spirit. And it tells us this, you are no longer your own. You were bought with a price and you were paid with a preciousness. So your body no longer belongs to you. It's now God's temple. And he's the manager. You're under new management. So he tells you how to live. He tells you what your identity is. He tells you how you should manage your body. And all of us know this. There are times as a follower of Jesus that my body doesn't want to cooperate. My feelings and desires don't want to cooperate. Sometimes I have evil desires. Sometimes I have ungodly desires. Sometimes I have thoughts contrary to the scripture. And what do I do at that point is not align my life to the lie. I go back to the truth and say, what does God say? And I have to say, that's not who I am anymore. That's not who God says I am. That's not who he's made me to be. So I am going to reject those desires. You know what Jesus called it? He called it denying ourselves. We say a powerful, authoritative no to sin. We say a no to those carnal desires and those carnal thoughts. And we say, instead, I'm going to live according to the scripture. That's how a Christian is to live. And so the scripture brings this out in Romans chapter 12 in such a powerful and poignant way. I encourage you to turn there or to look at the screens and and catch this. But in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, actually, it says, I beseech you, this is Paul writing, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, with body issues, the thought is that the key is to change or fix our body to align with our feelings. 
And if you're looking to your body to fulfill you, you're headed for disappointment. Let me share something a little painful with you. There was a man named Dr. Paul McHugh. He's a former psychiatrist and the chief of John Hopkins Medicine. Now, you got to know, John Hopkins was a pioneer in the sex change operation movement. In fact, they were some of the first people to do this. And back in the 1970s, McHugh said, I could not in good conscience as a psychiatrist recommend this surgery. He said, we must stop these operations at once. And John Hopkins stopped them. The reason was that they had talked to post-operative transsexuals and they discovered that the patients were worse off after the surgery than they were before. They found in rearranging the skin on these people's bodies, they didn't really resolve the issues in their soul. So here's what you said about the transitional surgery. He concluded that Hopkins was fundamentally cooperating with a mental illness. We psychiatrists, I thought, would do better to concentrate on trying to fix their minds and not their genitalia. He was saying this was a thinking issue. This was a mental issue. And we all have mental and thinking issues at times that we have to align with truth. And he's saying instead of trying to align their thoughts with truth, they tried to align their body with their thoughts, and it led to problems. And it does lead to problems. Let me tell you an unspoken tragedy of the transgender movement. There is tremendous regret in many people who have these transitional surgeries. It's very, very high. In fact, those who've had transitional surgery have a 19 times higher likelihood of committing suicide than the general population. Not twice as much, not three times as much, 19 times as much. That's staggering and that's painful. So why am I even speaking on this? Why am I talking about this? Why is it that as followers of Jesus, we must reject this idea of gender fluidity? Well, first of all, because it's a form of rebellion against God and against his created order. But second of all, because it's bad for society. You see, the Bible says when we become Christians, we become citizens of heaven. But that doesn't mean we abandon our natural citizenship. That means that we come back to this earth to be the very best citizens we can possibly be. That means we care about our world. We care about people. We care about society. We care about this world. And so we want the best for this world. And as followers of Jesus, we believe God's way is best. We believe it's best. And we believe that this idea of a society living in gender fluidity, being controlled by gender confusion, is not best for individuals, and it's not best for society. And in Romans 12, 1, Paul says we are to submit our bodies. Next, Paul says, rather than transforming our bodies, we're to transform our thinking. Look at Romans 12, 2. He writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. As I've said before, we all have false identities. We all have areas of our life where our thinking is distorted. We all have desires that are contrary to God's will and God's blessed. But we can't blame God for that. We simply have to recognize we're fallen. And we have to say, I'm going to align my thinking, my desires, and my life to God's word instead of my feelings and my emotions and my carnal thoughts. And this is a message today on dealing with gender confusion, but it's far bigger than that. This is really the key to Christ-centered living, God-glorifying living, and victorious living. You know, I know that this weekend, there's going to be a few people, based statistically on percentages, that are dealing with gender dysphoria. And my heart goes out to you. This church's heart goes out to you. We're not here to condemn you, for heaven's sake, no. We're here to empathize and to feel compassion towards you, but also to tell you there's a better way than this transgender philosophy that's being pushed. There's God's way. And God has made you for a specific purpose. He's made you in the image of God. He loves you and he wants the very best for you. And that is the message. And the message is that for all of us, because listen, we're all battling something. 
Most of us aren't battling gender dysphoria, but we're all battling something. There's something that can get to us. There's something we're struggling with. It may be a very real issue physically. It may be a very real issue emotionally. It may be a sin issue, but we're all dealing with something. But the way to victory is always the same. Not to trust our fickle feelings, not to trust our carnal thinking, but to trust God's word. And to stand on truth and to resist the lie. And that is how God has called us to live. Now, I want to give you one last thought here today that I think is critically important. And that is that Jesus Christ knew dysphoria. God became a man. But more than that, he went to a cross where he took the sin of the world to himself. The sinless, perfect son of God took sin to himself. Let me tell you, that's dysphoria. See, the opposite of dysphoria is euphoria. Jesus didn't suffer euphoria on the cross because it wouldn't have been suffering. He suffered dysphoria. It wasn't right. He felt like he was in a body that didn't belong to him. He had sin placed on him that wasn't his. And on the cross, he could have questioned God. God isn't wise. God isn't good. God isn't caring. God isn't true. But on the cross... And he'd already made the decision in the garden. In the garden, he said, not my will, your will be done. And he nailed his will to the will of the cross. And it wasn't easy, it was difficult. But he nailed his will to the will of the cross. When he felt God had abandoned him, and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He held on to the truth of God despite his fickle feelings and despite his carnal thoughts. Because thoughts will vary. Jesus had the perfect thoughts any human being could ever have. But on the cross, there would have been attacks in his mind, attacks in his identity, attacks on the character of God. But he chose to believe the truth over the lie. And when he did, he died. He died. And we, when we do that, there's often a death, a death to self, a death to our own desires, a death to our own will. But he didn't stay dead. <laughs> He went into death to kill death and rose from the dead victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he came to give us new life. And he came to bring a recreated universe where we won't have these problems anymore. When everything bad is going to be done away with and everything that is sad is going to come untrue. All because Jesus was obedient to the Father. And let me tell you, ultimately, as difficult and as hard as it may be to obey God, God's way is always best. And in the end, you'll see the wisdom of God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for every one of us here today. And I want to particularly pray for those with gender dysphoria because I know there are some. There's some watching online. There's some in one of our campuses sitting in the auditorium. There's some who are listening on radio. And I want to tell you, God loves you. God cares about you. And Heavenly Father, I pray you would reveal your love to them that you would make your love and your care for them so real that they would see they have been made in the image of God and their gender has a purpose. And Father, I know that the struggle is real and it's probably not gonna be easy, but I pray you would give them the grace and the strength to stand against the lie and believe the truth. And I pray for every one of us, Lord, that we would in every area of our life do just the same that in the areas where we're struggling and battling and believing lies and being assaulted by our fickle feelings, I pray that instead we would believe the truth of your word. We would stand on the truth. We would embrace the truth. We would live the truth. We would believe the truth. And the truth would indeed set us free. And we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen.